And third is they have a, a very high velocity customer acquisition model. Because if you are creating an N of one market with a new business model, you have to, you have to capture this market quickly before anybody else can. Uh, otherwise it'll fracture forever for you. And I'm just going to introduce our host, David Booth. Uh, a fun fact about David is he, in 2017, drove uh, international expansion at Carta. So making it a very small world, Henry and David go back. So David, over to you. Kick us off. Introduce Hello. Henry. Thank you. Um, yeah, welcome, Henry. Um, so in the room, you've got uh, on the scale, a sort of post seed series a founders scaling themselves as leaders you've got on deck angels uh who are mostly operators who are uh, embarking on their angel investing careers um and or you know scaling up portfolios you've got odf who are all full of uh talented uh you know former executive former, former founders who are in the very early stage of exploring what's new um really uh good crew so um just wanted to have a you know create a good space for, for a good conversation and um I mean, there's, there's so much to learn here. Uh, Ty introduced it. Obviously, we have um, we had uh, you know a, a brief overlap in our histories. I, I was I drawn to to join Carter because I was absolutely fascinated, and to this day, still am, um, by the, just the phenomenal size of the, of the business you're going to build. But um, most people probably don't really um, know what it is, but you know, but beyond the cap table. So you know, people know Carter as as a way to manage your shares. Um, what else is it? What what is this crazy thing you're building? Yeah, so, so today, uh, just fun facts about us. Uh, so first, thanks for having me, David, and it's great to meet all of you. I think, you know, meeting uh, founders in the early stage is like the funnest thing I get to do. Uh, so um, so please also just like interrupt and ask questions, and I'd love to hear about uh, hear from other people about what they're doing as well. Um, but but I, I miss the nostalgia of the early, early stage. You know, fun facts about us, we're today about a thousand uh, employees, um, about 150 million in, in ARR. We do it across four business units. Uh, David mentioned um, earlier the our core, core business is what we call our corporations business unit. They all run their own PL. Uh, uh, it's about 70 percent of our our revenue today, uh, is, and that's what we sell: cap table software, 498 software, you know, um, expense accounting, things like that to companies. Our second business unit is is about another 25 percent of that, and it's uh, investor. Uh, fund administration for venture funds. So we do back office accounting and LP management, things like that. So basically the cap table, you know, we, we solved the, the problem for managing your investors for companies. Then we, we said, hey, can we also solve the problem for venture funds to manage their investors with, you know, their LPs. Uh, so that's a, about $30 million business for us. Um, and then our, our newest business is called our private equity business. And basically we took our cap table product, reskinned it for private equity. Uh, which are often slightly different capital structures. So we needed to, to modify the product. It's brand new. I think it's uh, maybe a million and a half or $2 million now in ARR, uh, but it's growing quickly. Uh, and it's sort of the first and it's the kind of one, two punch that, that we strategy that we had in venture where we've developed a relationship with companies through the cap table software through that relationship with the companies, we built a relationship with their investors. And then we sold them, you know, uh, investor management software and back office accounting to the venture funds. Now we're doing the same thing with private equity. Um, we're doing just the early stages of step one, establish a relationship with these companies, and hopefully in a couple of years, we'll be selling uh, uh, back office software to the PD funds that own these, these companies. And then our fourth business unit is um, uh, brand new, uh, started in January. I think they just earned their first $2 million check uh, in revenue, um, uh, and that's Carta X, which is our, our private stock exchange. So, so those are the four business units we operate today. It's fascinating. And my, my obvious next question has got to be, how do you think about, I mean, you always have a lot of these different units. I remember you commenting at one point, um, sort of the prioritization of what you want to build. Uh, and one framework you had was, um, can that business be a, an, an N of one or, or a one of, or is it a one of N? Um, and thinking about like, uh, it's strategic value to Carter as the whole versus as a sort of a standalone business. How, how do you think about prioritizing what to build? Why did private equity come along recently? And you know, what was its moment now? Yeah, it's this great checklist. It's a great question. We had this checklist, David, I think we used to play this game because you were thinking a lot about new markets for us when you were with us. And 
you know, we play this game where we're like, before we enter a new market, we're like, hey, imagine, you know, we're, we didn't enter this market. Um, and five years from now, we're sitting around the table and some startup, some company came in uh, and had just dominated this market. Uh, and in five years, got 80% market share, became the de facto standard, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we're all sitting around going, how did we miss this? You know, what, what did this company do that we're now sitting here five years later going, how did we lose to this, to this startup? And we tend to, it tends to boil down to three things. One is this company figured out how to make this fractured market uh, an N of one market, what we call N of one, which means the market microstructure allows for one and only one winner in this market versus it we call a one of N market, which, which the market microstructure allows for multiple competitors. Um, so the company figured out how to make this an N of one market usually via network effect, but sometimes through economies of scale, there's way, different ways you can make markets N of one, but usually it's network effect. Two, they had some business model innovation that was, that's hard to replicate. They changed the business model. And for us, when we think about new market creation, because we're in the business of new market creation, we, we tend to avoid going after markets with incumbents. We look for markets that don't exist yet and then try to make a market in it. Um, and our definition of how, we, how do we define a new market is, we've figured out a way uh, to make money exchange hands in a way that hasn't happened before. So some, you know, like Airbnb, new market creation, they figured out a way to get somebody who's looking for apartment to give money to somebody who has an apartment. Nobody did that before. You always used to pay the hotels instead. Um, so they, this company is, the second thing is companies figure out some new unique business model innovation that's hard to replicate. And third is they have a, a very high velocity customer acquisition model. Because if you are creating an N of one market with a new business model, you have to you have to capture this market quickly before anybody else can. Uh, otherwise, it'll fracture forever for you. And so, uh, so those are kind of the, the things that we go through when we decide, you know, whether to enter a market or not. And then the the, the timing question for us is actually even some, is simpler. Um, so if we decide, hey, we definitely want to enter this market, and there's there's a lot of markets we we have on our strategy deck that we want to enter at some point. So then the question is timing. Um, mm -hmm. So when do you do it? And for us, it's, it's uh, the first question we ask is, does, does it get easier to enter this market if we wait or does it get harder? And there's some markets where actually it gets easier if you wait because you, you, you have more tangentialness. You know, you, you are a bigger brand. You're like, you know, for Carta X, you know, you, you had to wait. The longer we waited before we launched the stock, private stock exchange, uh, the easier it would be to launch because we had more critical mass, we had more companies, more investors, all of those things. There's other markets where it actually, your, your window of opportunity closes the longer you wait. Uh, and often that's because other competitors are coming in or the market is changing quickly on you. Uh, and so those are the ones we, we sequence in, in first. So, so those are really the two, two parts. One is, do we enter the market or not? That's a binary question. And then the second is, the second is okay, when do we do it? Uh, and that's a question of opportunity cost. Yeah, I love that uh, framework of, of does uh, the opportunity get better or, or does the op window of opportunity close the longer you wait? I think that was actually the, the answer to the, the, a lot of the international stuff I was working on, that um, the opportunity would get easier and, and bigger the, you know, by waiting a bit longer. Um, and, and it's exciting to see you doing a lot of that now. But um, when you, um, I mean, you've, you've mentioned Carter X a few times as one of the big topics I, I want to get into because I know it's incredibly relevant for angels incredibly relevant for, for the founders and, and you know, employees getting the liquidity. Um, it's also an example where you are um, serving multiple customer groups. I mean, the core customer for Carter from the start has been a company who pays for um, you know, software on a you know, annual or a, or a monthly contract. Um, d does anything change? So I'm not quite, you, know, you can segue this to Carter X if you, if you like, um, but this is still a, a business model or a, or a prioritization question. Does anything change when you think about serving a new customer? So instead of serving the founders of the companies or the, or the, 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 cap, the cap table purchaser, suddenly you're serving an investor or you're serving um, maybe a research analyst who would love to get at your data, but selling the data to them could be a conflict of interest with the, with the core customer group. Does, does that factor into your prioritization? Yeah, you know, Carta X is a classic marketplace. And it's the first marketplace that we built because all our other businesses are B2B SaaS. You know, you have a customer, you have a product, you sell, you know, the product to the customer and it's, it's, it's done. Um, Carta X is a, is a marketplace. 
Um, and all marketplaces, the, the reason why marketplaces are, are really hard to build um, is uh, one, for, there's two reasons. One is you have to figure out how to bootstrap into the market, right? Because the marketplace is invaluable until you have market participants. So how do you make it valuable to the first participant um, if, if there's no other participants? So, so you got to bootstrap in. It's like a network problem. You, you got induction. Induction works. N plus one equals work, but work, works. But how do you get the first one? Um, so, so there's this bootstrapping problem that exists. But the other reason why marketplaces are hard is uh, if, if a, uh, is that you have to find product market fit twice. Uh, you know, if, if getting a company, you know, off the ground is finding product market fit is lightning strikes and marketplaces, <laughs> lightning has to strike twice on the demand and supply side. You, you, you've got to get both of these things to work. Um, so you have to find product market fit twice at the same time. And that's why marketplaces are so challenging uh, to get to get going. And all marketplaces have this this property. Um, if, if there are any of the founders that are starting marketplaces, that all marketplaces follow this template which is you have some um, implicit demand that is not being met in the world. Often you can't see it. You don't know that this demand exists because it's, it's unmet, it's implicit. And then the entrepreneur has figured out how to unlock supply. So, you know, uh, I'll just go back to Airbnb because it's such a simple business model to, to understand. The, the Chesky and the founders had believed there was implicit demand that people would want to sleep on other people's couches. Um, nobody else believed that, but they believed that. Uh, and what they did was they figured out how to unlock supply and open the doors and open up people's couches. Uh, and so Carta X actually has a similar problem today. Uh, we have tons of demand on the platform. We have lots and lots of investors that want to buy uh, stock for private companies, secondary. Um, and our job now is to, to unlock supply. And this is a classic marketplace. All marketplaces go through this. They, they start with more demand than supply. They've unlocked supply. Some oftentimes they can, you know, unlock supply really well, the market explodes and then they have to go figure out demand and they're constantly managing the supply and demand uh, on the marketplace. We have a very classic early marketplace dynamic where we have lots of demand and we're, we're trying to unlock supply. And so to, to answer your question, David, so now we're talking to our customers, our 20,000 cap table customers saying, hey, you really should get on Carta X, uh, you know, and, and let your shares trade and then we can unlock supply. You know, hopefully at some point, this, this tips over and suddenly everybody's like, hey, can we list on Cardax? And we have to go, whoa, 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 we don't have enough investors to mm -hmm. soak up all, the, all these shares. And then we got to go go to you know, Wall Street and start you know, uh, getting money to buy all these shares. But right now we're a supply constrained market. I love it. What, um, I, no need to comment on, on competitors directly, but, but one comparison I, I always had here was, was with you know, Carter's eventual inevitable uh, exchange business once you've launched it as you have versus say like um, Eric Rai's uh, LTSE, which is you know, building in theory a, a similar product. It's a, it's a new stock exchange, um, but you know, had to go out and very actively build that supply uh, by having relationships and upstream products, various things where, where Carter had this sort of natural baked in um, source of supply in theory and, and being the source of truth for, for, for equity and source, you know, source of truth for ownership. Um, are you seeing, uh, out of interest, as you said, here's, here's sort of a, a good topic perhaps to dig into, like how does that pitch work for founders? Uh, you've, you've written about and spoken about um, liquidity is coming, was the title of the blog. Um, the, the subject was uh, liquidity will be table stakes for private companies in the future in the way that stock options is table stakes now. And it wasn't always the case. Um, so how is that like resonating with founders? What are the common conversations you're having? with and, and also actually, let, let's let's go deep in, in the details like what are the typical stages that that companies start first thinking about liquidity what what is the the way that they do it so um i want to i want to run a, a secondary which of my employees do i offer to do i offer it to my early investors do i offer it to my later stage investors etc let, let's do it <laughs> yeah sure so um, so Carta X is really for later stage companies. This might be like for scale founders and beyond. Um, roughly, uh, you know, we'll, we'll start working with companies that are $500 million market cap and above. Um, but by the time you're, you're listed and trading on Carta X, we typically, you know, uh, work with companies that are a billion dollar market cap. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the entry point in, in the Carta X. The, um, the, the, the other part of, being ready for Carta X is that 
you are not uh, primary capital constrained, right? Because you can you can allow shares to trade on secondary markets, but but you you've got enough capital, right? That that you don't you're not if you're also trying to raise primary capital, you don't want secondaries to trade. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to be profitable, but you have to know that you you are able to raise primary and that there's enough of demand for your shares. So it's really a very elite group of companies that uh, that, uh, that can trade on uh, on Carta X. I think what's what's really interesting about Carta X for many of the founders that will hopefully you know list on Carta X you know in a few years uh, here is that I think liquidity will be a competitive advantage. Uh, but also uh, liquidity for talent uh, will be a competitive advantage in, in retaining and, and hiring uh, employees. But I also think that the, the real advantage to being private is that you can pick your investors. You know, it's so, it's so odd to me. I, I feel like one of the greatest tricks the devil ever pulled, the devil being Wall Street, is that they convinced the entrepreneurs that you didn't, um, it, it didn't matter who owned your shares and that they are just commoditized and Wall Street should just do whatever they want. With your shares. It's so funny, you know, as private company CEOs, we make a big deal about who, who's on our cap table, but then we go public. Uh, and then it, you know, we don't care. It doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore. And the private market, there, there's no such thing as an activist investor. It doesn't exist because CEOs pick their investors. There's no such thing as short selling. You, you just can't do it in the, in the private markets because we get to pick our investors. And the most important thing about picking your investors is that you can match the duration of the investor to your capital needs. So, you know, a lot of private companies were building things that take years uh, to, to come to fruition. Um, and so when I work with investors, I'm like, hey, you know, your capital is going to be tied up for seven to 10 years. And they're like, great, no problem, because I only work with investors that have, you know, decade long holding periods. Um, but once you go public, you've got some investors that have decade long holding periods, decade long holding periods. You got other investors that have 10 minute holding periods and you're now managing all of that on one shareholder ledger. Uh, and so I think the future of um, entrepreneurship is private and liquid, where I get all the benefits of being public because I have liquidity, but I get all the benefits of being private because I get to pick my investors and my stock is not commoditized. I mean, that seems like a good, a good opportunity to comment on the state of the market today, because um, I think two years ago, that was pretty uncontroversial as a comment um, that, yeah, it was, it was obvious that the, the number of companies going public had, had been declining at a pretty rapid rate and that the, um, you know, it seemed like the IPO and the public markets were no longer a necessary part of, of the fundraising journey. Um, today it seems different because, you know, there's new vehicles, SPACs that came along and made it very easy to go public. Uh, or easier in, in a way, um, there's just been a, a string, you know, throughout 2020, um, what's going on at that? Like, is, is this, is, is this some sort of great revitalization of, of it as a path? Um, and have you changed your thesis around the, the role of the public markets at all? Or, or is this just a, a, a hype driven blip in the, in the, in the financial world? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. You know, I think the SPAC phenomenon is, um, uh, is a demonstration of how starved investors are, public market investors, which is the majority of the world, are for growth. Um, that they will invest in these promotes and SPACs, which are pretty dubious uh, financial vehicles. They, they, they really, they're, they're somewhat predatory to investors in them. Like they mostly take advantage of retail investors. Um, that you know, a retail investor will invest in a SPAC and have no idea what the asset is going to be and pay all these promotes and, and bonuses. Uh, just to have access, and and, and it, it really speaks to, I think, the dearth uh, or the lack of growth um, and quality assets in the public markets. And so they're finding, you know, money is finding ways to, to, to access growth. So I think that's the macro level. I think the micro level um, is challenging because, uh, you know, the IPO and the, the public uh, process, the going public process is, is designed to help make sure that companies are prepared to go public and, and be publicly traded companies. And so, so if, if a company that wasn't ready to go public now finds a back door and they're being public and is able to be public before they're ready, is that a win or a loss, um, uh, both for the company and for, for the market itself? You know, I was talking to a CEO uh, uh, the other day um, he was saying, you know, I was talking about Carta X and SPACs and, you know, IPOs and like what, what he was thinking about this, and he, how, how he was thinking about this. And he, he said to me, he goes, you know, Henry, like, I don't even want to be a public company 
I'm a public CEO. Um, but I, I have a, you know, these SPACs that are coming to me, my investors want liquidity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, it's so hard to say no, because he, and he goes, I got, check this out. I got a term sheet for a SPAC for a $2 billion valuation on 30 million of revenue and negative 75 million of the beta. Uh, and it's just like, how do you, he's like, how do I turn that down? And he, he says, I know, I know how this story goes. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna take this back. I'm gonna raise a bunch of primary. The market's gonna correct. And I'm gonna get hammered for three years where I'm trying to build back up, you know, into, the, into, into a, a, a stock, you know, that's underwater uh, uh, and, and get past my, my SPAC price. Um, and I'm just going to get beat up for two or three years, but how do I turn down this capital um, that's so cheap to me right now? Mm. And he's stuck, right? He, he doesn't know what to do. And I think a lot of, I've been talking to a lot of CEOs that are really trying to figure out, you know, what do I do in this environment? I, I know in the short term, it's a bad, it's a long term, it's a bad idea, but in the short term, it's a good idea. Um, uh, so the SPAC thing, you know, we'll see. Um, it's hard to imagine this this continues. I mean, there's no more SPACs now than there are reasonable targets um, mm. uh, to acquire or to merge with. Um, it, it's, it'll be really interesting, but it's definitely we're we're watching this stuff really closely. Um, whether backdoors to to the public markets is good or bad. There's um, two ways I really want to take this conversation. One of them um, goes into talking about managing your board and how you might convince your board to not make you do that, that kind of thing. I, I've got a lot of sort of managing the company questions lined up next, so we'll go there shortly. Um, one first would be, I, I know that one of your sort of big motivations is um, increasing ownership and and sort of um, thinking about inequality through a lens of, of ownership of, of equity as opposed to you know, distribution. There's many ways that people propose it. Um, now, one thing that the public markets do offer is large index funds and pension funds that can, you know, you have the, the teachers unions that are deploying their, their retirement savings into the public markets. Now, if if what you're saying is true and that the best stocks will stay private, um, how do you think about breaching that chasm between uh, creating access or democratizing access to the best high technology, you know, high technology growth stocks and the the you know, investors who are currently restrained to being in the public markets? Do you, do you see like interest coming from the big pension funds into Carter X, is, is that a, a direct solve or how, how do you get to that? Yeah, so we're, we're working uh, on an index, the Carter 100 um, index uh, as well, to, so that people can access at least venture as an asset class um, in retail today. We're also doing a lot of policy work on accredited investor rules and the democratization of, of um, uh, access to private companies where, you know, Right now, it's a pretty restricted group that, act, that can access private growth, um, and we're you know moving a credit investor from a financial fitness test to a to a, um, uh, a, a from a means test to a financial fitness test where you know you can test into it. Basically, you take a test and say, "I, I know what I'm doing," and so now I can invest in private companies. You're also seeing Reg CF, a lot of Reg um, Reg Reg A, Reg A plus. Uh, rules changing. We're we're trying to help out with that as well. So there's a lot of things we can do on the policy side. Um, very specifically on Carta X today, individual investors aren't allowed, but my hope is we'll get there uh, when we work through some more of the credit investor stuff. But like all the pension funds, all the large institutional buyers in the public markets are all on Carta X and ready to buy in private companies. So so pensioners will have indirect access uh, to Carta companies. Great. Um, before we move on from from Carta X. Um, one question. This is this is actually you know uh, motivated uh, by self interest as well. How, how do you think about? Or how do you see CEOs who, who are thinking about listing on Carrex, um think about early investor liquidity? Uh, think about uh, early employee liquidity. A, a typical framework I, I heard. I, I know you've done this recently for Carter. Uh, had a secondary offering when when Carter X launched. Um, do you say you know employees who've been with us for X years get to list? X percent of their vested stock. Uh, what's the, the mental model that I should have in mind? All right. So for us, I'll tell you exactly what we did. Um, we um, allowed employees to sell twenty percent of their vested shares per auction. So there's there's four auctions a year. So they can kind of you know if they wanted they could probably get eighty percent you know in a year. Uh, but twenty percent per auction uh, or per trading window. Uh, Former employees could sell 10%. So you get more liquidity if you stick around. I don't want people to like quit so they can get liquidity. 
uh, and then series seed and series A investors were allowed to sell, um, but series B and above were not. And over time, we, we may start including series B in and then, you know, series C as we, as we get longer in the tooth. But that, that's the, the current, current rule set for us. Got it. I know that, that, that makes sense. Um, okay, switching gears, I'd love to hear, we're still on the fundraising topic, but um, think about primaries. I know that you've um, been gracious as to, to share your pitch decks with the world and, and we've all learned a lot from those over the Series A's through whatever the latest one was, DE. Um, what do you think about running an effective fundraise process? So how do you, I know you have some strong, maybe contrarian views on getting the right price on help forcing investors to make decisions on, um, this is a good one for ODS who are probably going out for their series A's, you know, in the next six months in particular, if, if not already. Yeah. Um, so my, I guess I have two pieces of advice that may be a little bit contrarian from what other people hear, which is, um, the traditional advice is, you know, you should meet, you know, with investors and, you know, spend time with them and get to know them over, you know, the relationship. Um, I, unless I'm actively fundraising, I uh, don't meet with investors. Um, uh, and the reason is that there's two reasons. So one is it's a waste of time. Uh, you don't do anything. It's the, the, the reason they're invested, they're, they're paid to waste your time, uh, is what investors do. Uh, and the reason they're meeting with you is they're trying to get information to get ahead of anybody else if, if you are a hot company. And so only two things can happen. Either um, you give them information and they don't think it's interesting. And then there's market signal, you know, and they'll go tell everybody, or nothing's confidential. They all tell everybody about the companies that they met. So now the word, word on the street is you're not an interesting company or you are an interesting company and they'll try to preempt it. And then you have no leverage now because you don't have multiple term sheets. And so there's, there's everything to be gained for an investor to meet you early and talk to you and spend time with you. There's nothing to be gained for the entrepreneur. Um, uh, so then when, when do you meet them? And you, you meet them when you're starting the process. And so once you start the process, you find all the investors that you're interested in meeting. Um, you, you project plan this thing, you're like over five weeks, I'm going to meet all the investors, I'm going to do the individual meetings, I'm going to do the partner meetings, this is the due date for term sheets, this is blah, 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 and you, you manage all this because what you're trying to do is you're trying to drive all the demand into, into a single point in time. You're effectively running an auction. And so you have to set up it, so the worst thing that can happen is you get a term sheet uh, early and you have to go yes or no on this term sheet before you have more information on other term sheets, right? So you say, yes, you have, you never get the information on what other term sheets would be. You say no, and then you go, you get the next term sheet and you have a now a yes, no decision again and a yes, no decision. What you really want to do is get all the term sheets uh, in at the same, on the same day, ideally, right? The same point in time. And then now you have a true auction process that you can start finding what price, you, you have price discovery, you know what price, what the clearing price would likely be. And then if you want to negotiate, you actually have multiple offers you can negotiate against. Hmm. Have, have you, um, I mean, the, the preemption process can be, can be tempting. Um, have you seen, uh, is, is that sort of linked to the, the, yeah, the, the, the the, the later stage, are you seeing some of that uh, flowing earlier as well? Um, or how's that changed over the last couple of years? I mean, when you were doing your Series A and B, it was, it was certainly a different market. I, rem I remember a particular Series A, I think, was, was quite a hard one for Carter to raise um, when you were you were uh, out you know, thinking about the, the size of the market that the investors didn't quite see at the time. Yeah, um, you know, it's a different market today. <laughs> it's a, it's a, you know, it's definitely a founder's market. Uh, it's a seller's market uh, today. Um, a lot of best investors are trying to preempt to get ahead of stuff and, and get in on deals. Um, um, you know, it's a very reasonable thing to say, hey, and I did this a lot. I didn't do it on my Series A. We couldn't get a term sheet. But if you know there's a lot of demand to say, hey, you know, uh, please don't send me a term sheet yet. Um, I, I'll let you know when it's time, but please, please don't send me one yet. And you can say, you know, I'm still doing market discovery. You can always use the 498 thing as a reasonable reason. Like if once you send a term sheet, I got to change my 498. I don't want to do that. So, so please don't send a term sheet because it'll mess up my 498 evaluation. I'm going to do all of this at once and, and, and hold them back. 
um, uh, so that you can run a, a tight process. That's actually a really good one um, for, for anyone who, who's not intimately familiar. The 409A is the, is the valuation uh, of your common stock. And as soon as you've received a material offer to um, to invest, you have, you're no longer allowed to issue stock to your own employees. So it's actually a pretty substantial inconvenience. Um, it's also a good opportunity to jump in and, and chat about um, the 409A business and in particular the, the services businesses at, on, at, at Carter. Now one, um, you had this uh, mental model, I, I remember, I, I was at Carter around the time that the Silicon Valley Bank um, 409A acquisition went through. And um, there's sort of a, a bundle of topics I'd love to unpack here. W one is thinking about um, services businesses within a technology company. Ultimately, um, you know, Carter has several, and I think they're quite important parts of the flywheel. Another is uh, m and as a growth and, and expansion tool. So you had um, a formula where you, you said something along the lines of you can, abide, you, can, you can acquire a services business for a multiple of 1.5x, but you can, um, and then you are valued at a, you know, a, a 20x revenue multiple. So, that, so the, the arbitrage there is, is, is obvious to start with. Um, and then the final sort of bundled topic here is, uh, how, how did that change the culture? I mean, a lot of probably everyone in this room is, is building a technology company. They think they want to load up on on engineers and product managers and and you know just keep teams small and lean and things. Uh, whereas a lot of the services mindset that I think you have aboard these days will be much more um, traditional accounting, finance, legal. Um, feel free to tackle. There's three topics there. Take take them any, any way you want, and I can keep asking questions all day. Yeah. I you know, we, you know, you know, everyone who are with us, like we, one of the playbooks we run, and I, I, we do a lot of things badly, but I think one of the things we do pretty well is um, this playbook of, of taking services industries and turning them into software industries. Um, and so uh, the first one, CapTable, before eShares existed, CapTable management was a services business that lawyers did, or paralegals did. And we, we basically took the CapTable, put it in the cloud and made it a software. Uh, business. 49A, before we got involved, was a services business with all these boutique you know, valuation firms that did this manually with spreadsheets. And then we turned it into a software business by automating a lot of the 49A uh, work. Fund administration, which I mentioned at the beginning, is sort of 30 percent of our, our business, what we sell to venture funds, is a very traditional accounting service. And we are um, in process of converting that into a software business by automating more and more of the work that the accountants do. And so, so we're very, that, that's a playbook we love. We love doing it organically where we just hire a bunch of accountants or valuation analysts or paralegals that do this stuff manually. And then we build product around them or inorganically by buying a services firm, buying the book of business, and then putting all of their clients on our software and then moving it from a 30% you know, gross margin to a eighty percent gross margin. Where, to your point, you know, we can buy it for you know a single digit two, you know, two x revenue, and and we trade now at forty x uh, ARR. So, um, so it's a, a very powerful arbitrage. the The challenge of, of that doing that is there's this culture that's both good and bad. Uh, this culture clash uh, that happens where. If you buy or you hire people who are traditionally, you know, from a services industry, um, uh, the, the wonderful thing about it is they bring an incredible focus uh, on customer service, right? Engineers tend not to be the best at customer service, but you know, these client services, services people uh, just bring such a focus on customer service and it's, it's a wonderful injection into a technology company. The downside is that um, they're used to services. They, 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 you have to teach them how we're going to automate more and more of it. And, and if they come to Carta, they're receptive to this concept. But the, the challenge as a founder is, by definition, when you automate more and more of it, you're creating less and less work for them. And so then all these service people that join are like, wait, you're automating me out of a job. And so the challenge has always been, we have to grow faster uh, than we're automating. Uh, so that there's always more work to do and that the services people, they start doing higher and higher level work, right? Instead of typing spreadsheets, they're consulting customers, but, but we're always growing faster than the automation is happening. So we have to grow fast enough that we don't have to lay people off uh, via automation. And that's always been the balancing act. It, that's, um, that's a really good point. I mean, uh, certainly a balancing act uh, could present 
a, an incredible opportunity though as well i mean maybe those people don't necessarily want to be services you know spreadsheet jockeys for life and this is actually their opportunity to transition into a product career um or something I, i'm sure you've got good at pitching that one um the um the model for it was yeah the, the idea of t i think taking services which are linear uh there's it's almost the, the classic paul graham advice uh, do things that don't scale um and figuring out how to turn them into non-linear businesses or, or exponential businesses and i think that's a really powerful framework um it applies to many you know other business including our own i mean you know we're running uh running events or running you know various things very hands-on but behind the scenes I, th I think you know much more of a, a scalable social network kicking into gear um the 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 as you was going to ask about the, the the culture um and this is sort of building off of the services piece but but more broadly um you have uh i mean you've, you've you've got some some incredible execs around your your team i know you've you've said in the past that one of your main jobs today is hiring the right execs getting them in place empowering them to run the businesses particularly if you've got four of them um what have you learned about there's a, a concept called the, the half-life of the executives i picked up somewhere um where you know how do you f figure out if they're doing a good job how long should they stay around should you try and invest in leveling up your executives or do you just replace them as the business grows and, and the needs change um there's another bundle of topics that I, I'm, I'm i'm excited to dive into thinking a lot about now myself yeah sure you know the the exact stuff is is hard and changes over over time um you know, this is great this is great post i don't know if i necessarily believe this but it's a really interesting way to think about this, which is that, um, uh, you know, these st startups, successful startups scale non-linearly, as you said, David, um, but people scale linearly. And so that's, there's always this sort of disconnect between the speed of the growth of the company and then the, the executives that, you know, they come in at a single, at a point in time, and then you, you they, they don't grow as fast as the company, and then they kind of scale out and then you got to recycle uh, executives. Um, you know, we, we, I've seen it all. You know, my CFO has been with me for four years now, a little over four years, um, and you know, scaling incredibly well. And I've seen execs come in, do well for six months, and then and then fall apart. So I've seen everything, you know, and everything in between. Um, I think you know, one of the things that I found really interesting that I learned is um, this question of when when I am struggling or like I'm not doing a good job with sales or product or whatever it is, you know, the product, you know, isn't developing, whatever it is, you know, I'm, I'm not doing a good job. The first immediate reaction is, hey, um, uh, we should, uh, we need to hire Henry, a, a chief product officer. We need to hire Henry, a better CTO. We need to hire, you know, it's, it's how do we, how do we plug in the gaps for Henry and help him? If, and I'll just pick on my CFO for a second, uh, since I mentioned him, if my CFO is struggling, right? Like, income statements are taking too long, you know, FPN, you know, budgeting is, isn't, you know, he's, he's off, you know, blah, 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 whatever it is. We don't go, Hey, we need to hire a bunch of people to help him. We go, we, we might need to replace the CFO. And I always felt like super unfair, right? Why, why is it that when I stumble, everybody rallies around me, but if an exec stumbles, uh, they, they immediately talk about replacing him. And this is at the exec level. This is at the board level. This is, this is ubiquitous. And I asked around, I couldn't figure this one out. Why, why, why the world worked this way? Um, and I, I finally kind of uh, realized it. Uh, um, and the answer is that um, when it comes to functionally scaling an organization, uh, unless you're like Facebook or Alphabet, you know, or Apple, you can find somebody that's done that before, where they've scaled, you know, that the company through that stage, right? You can find a VP of sales. If your VP of sales got you from 50 to 100, but it's, it's not getting from 100 to 200, you can go find a VP of sales somewhere that has done 100 to 200 and, and put them in and they can help you get from 100 to 200. So it's, it's replaceable. Um, it, it may be very expensive. That person may be expensive, but they're replaceable. It's very, for these vision focused startups, it's very hard to, to go higher vision. Um, you, you, if, if you have a particular view and vision of the world uh, and, and the founder is struggling with one of these functional things, it's way easier to go find someone to help them with the function than, than find somebody that can uh, 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 
do the function, but but also convey the vision. It just doesn't exist out there. They're not, there isn't, you know, they're not on monster.com. Um, and so that's why the, the founder CEO gets special latitude on this. And what I realized is that the two things at the limit, you know, in the early days, the founder has to be Jack of Jack or Jane of all trades, but in the limit, um, the founder really only has to do two things to keep their job. One is they have to maintain and articulate the vision for everybody to understand and follow through on. And two, they have to recruit the people that can execute on. If they can do those two things, everything else can be hired for. Like you can recruit for that. If you can't do those two things, that's that's when founder CEOs lose their jobs. I, I happen to know that your CFO has been with you about four or five years now. So it sounds like he's scaling with the company, which is exciting to hear. <laughs> um, how, how do you know, um, how do you know if they're not going to, and, and how do you have that conversation with them um, that says, Hey, Bob, you, you, you might not be, be around here long, we're going to start hiring your replacement now, because obviously hiring that replacement will require bringing them, you know, some executive in. Um, you know, have, have you been up front with the, the, the non scaling executive to say, we're going to level you and we'll support you, but you know, we're going to hire someone as your, your boss or, or is that conversation too jarring that it might, you know, ultimately result in, in their, their being less productive and, and leaving. Yeah. It's, um, it, it varies. Um, you know, it's this question of, to answer the first part of the second question, I get to the second is you know, how do you know when it's time? Um, and I, I have this, when I talk to employees and I do this kind of like, um, management training, uh, thing. And I, one of the questions I ask him is how do you evaluate a CEO? Um, and they'll, they'll say, um, you know, it's funny, uh, employees will often say, do the employees like the CEO? And I'm like, I'm pretty sure the board doesn't worry about that. Um, so it's, it's cute how they, they think about it, but they'll think like stock price, you know, revenue growth, all that stuff. But the hard part about that is how do you unpack the effectiveness of the CEO versus the market conditions? Um, uh, and it's very hard to do. Uh, and so what I tell people, uh, and I tell the board to evaluate me this way and everybody else to evaluate CEOs this way, which is, uh, it's, it's two things. Well, it's three things at Card, I'll add the third, but, but if you just look at effectiveness, it's one, does the CEO, does he or she know what to do? is question one. And then question two is, can he or she get the organization to do it? And if those two things are true, you, you've got a good good CEO. At Carta, uh, we had a third, well, so, so if those things are true, we um, have a good CEO. And I would say that's the same for executives. So when I look at executives, I say, does, does, this, does the executive know what to do? And can he or she, she get her organization, her team, her department to do what needs to get done? And, um, and at Carta, we had a third one when I do evaluations, which is, is he or she a, a, a professional, both professional and personal role model to others. Um, but those are the three things we look at. And almost, oh, if you look at those two things about this, he or she know what to do, can he or she get the organization to do it? What that really is, is a confidence question. And so most of the time, it's uh, the conversations start with, hey, you know, VP of whatever, or C, C suite, C level of whatever. Um, when I think about, do I have confidence that you know what to do and that you can get your organization to do those things? I'm losing confidence, hmm. to one or both of those. Uh, and once you start losing confidence, that's the, that's the beginning uh, of, of those conversations. And it's a very, what, what's really challenging about these is um, it's really counterintuitive Almost every, I've, you know, let go of a lot of execs in my day. Uh, I've been doing this for a while now. Every, almost every exec is surprised. Uh, and the reason that they're surprised uh, is because by kind of by definition to get where they are today as an executive, they were really good at everything they've done up to that point, point in time. Like they've never failed. They've always been successful. And then suddenly they're like, wait, I'm not successful here. Wait, what? You know? That can't be me. I have 20 years of success behind me. This is an out, you know, this must be Henry like, or, or the company, right? This company's messed up. Henry's messed up, whatever it is. And so it's, it's, it's so counterintuitive to them. Uh, and it's a very, very rare executive that will come to me first and go, hey, I don't think I'm really 
scaling here. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling. Um, most of the time, I always, if I think there's an opportunity to stay at the company, but be leveled, I, I'll always bring that up. Uh, it, it happens. So it's not, it, it does happen. It's rare. Most, most people feel like, um, uh, you know, the e ego won't handle it or it's just not the right move in their career to mm -hmm. level uh, and they go somewhere else. Uh, but I always offer it if I, if I feel like there's a better role for them. There's, um, there's a few, uh, a few, a few blogs out there from, from many years ago, um, which I still reference regularly on this topic. One of them was the, um, the essential startup managers FAQ, uh, from 2016. I think there was another called how to hire, um, the, the managers FAQ in particular had some fascinating stuff. I, I don't know how much of it is still directly applicable or, or how much has evolved over time. Um, but there was one about how do I grade employees? So it was kind of relevant maybe it's executives are different to, to employees. Now, when I was there, I think the, the self evaluation policy was in place. You don't give people scorecards. You just, you ask them to self reflect. Did that work? Uh, do you still do that? And this it might be my final question. Cause I just realized we're coming up now and Ty said, there's some questions in the, in the chat we should hit as well, but, um, we'll, we'll get it. Yeah, I think, um, uh, so the answer is last year we started grading employees. Uh, and it was a real culture, like it was really tough for me to, uh, to accept that. And what I realized is when you're smaller and you're, you know, the, the band of brothers and sisters, you know, rallying around the, the company, you know, having a grading system uh, creates more principal agent problem of like, hey, am I optimizing to get a good grade or am I really trying to help the company? When you get to scale, um, uh, the, you know, the support person or the, the IC engineer, you know, five, six levels below the CEO, seven levels below the CEO, doesn't really have that connection to the business and that fluidity. They're like, hey, how do I know that I'm doing a good job for, for this piece? Uh, and, it's, and it's very hard for them to figure that out. It's also very hard for their team leads who are often young junior managers to explain to them how this, how what they're doing contributes to the company and teach them self-evaluation. So we, we, we had a real hunger from the employee base. I, it shocked me because I was a terrible student as a young person and I hated getting report cards. It shocked me, but there was an overwhelming cry from card employees to get graded. Um, so we started doing performance reviews uh, and we do a four point system. Uh, we did our first one last year. We're coming up with our next six month cycle uh, next month. Right. Ty, Jason, do you, do you feel free to see the question? I've got more to go. If you, um, if you, yeah, if yeah, you run yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, Henry, this is really awesome. Thank you so much again. Um, we got a few related to Carta X that have, uh, quite a few upvotes. So I'll just kind of consolidate here, but, uh, and what type of information does the company need to share to trade on Carta X is kind of part one. And then, uh, the second Second one related is how has the adoption been so far? And uh, a few people in the on deck community are are interested in getting early access. Can so can you talk about what it would take to to get access? Yeah, totally. Um, so uh, quick first question: uh, We have a disclosures framework, but the high level is think what you would disclose in a um, private placement. You're you're raising a Series C. You know, whatever it is, uh, a growth equity round, you share your deck, your KPIs, you know, financials. Um, basically, we take that. Like for us, we took our Series F data room, updated it for the, you know, most recent quarter. And that's what we shared with, with Cardax investors. Um, so, so it's a pretty light lift if you're used to, uh, to, to, to fundraising. If you're interested, please reach out to, to me, Henry at Carta, or any of the Carta team, and we can funnel you to the, to the right people and talk about the listing process. Uh, you go through an application process, takes four to six. Well, once we can approve your application pretty quickly, but the listing process of getting you, we got to do some legal work. We got to do some diligence work on the company. Takes four to six weeks, but you're four to six weeks away from liquidity. Um, our, our next listing, I hope, will launch here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and we're kind of targeting one new company a month uh, for this year is the goal. Thank, thanks, Henry. We have another one here that I uh, wanted to share. It's a, a bit more detailed, so I'm going to just try to um, read it out for you. But how do you define an MVP, including the underlying ROI calculations and resource sizing of a regulated industry like private securities? 
Yeah, it's, it's a real challenge. We're trying to figure this out because we have a, a culture clash going on at the company today, which is we, we hire people from Wall Street that build Carta X and regulated transactional software. And then we have people, you know, from, from Silicon Valley that, you know, are ship it, ship and break, you know, things like, let's just see what happens. And how do you balance those, those two things? And you, I can see it when you talk to the product managers and the, and the engineers from, from the financial industry, you know, they measure 52 times of very deliberate, you know, and clear about what they're trying to accomplish. They make sure every I is dotted and T crossed. And then I work with engineers and product managers from Silicon Valley and they're just like, we'll ship it Henry and just see what happens. Uh, and so it's a very different uh, mindset. And I think part of the challenge of all of these FinTech companies is how do you balance this innovation arm with the, the regulatory compliance? Like you can't lose money, money arm of the company. Um, and I don't think there's a magic recipe. I think it's, it's, it depends a lot on the product, what you're trying to accomplish um, and being very thoughtful about the rollout, uh, rollout plan. I, I would say that the quick definition though for an MVP, you know, straight out of the, the book, Eric Reese's book is, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the smallest amount of product or effort that you can put in to learn something about what to do next. Um, and so as long as you're shipping enough to learn what to do next, that's the, that's, that's the definition of an MVP. Thanks, Henry. And uh, we've got, got um, another one here. So we, this is more related to org structure. And uh, I see some parallels to on deck because we, we have a similar uh, org structure here, but we're, uh, we've got someone asking, curious about the org structure around four business units. Um, what functions exist across units and within the units, and uh, how do they? Act, how do you actually build that at, at Carta? Yeah, so we um, uh, so the BUs are run by what we call a trifecta, which is a business product and engineering lead. And the the idea around it is that you know the the perfect co-founder trio would be a business person, a product person, and an engineering lead. You know. CEO, you know, chief product officer and chief technology officer. Uh, and um, uh, you can build any commercial business with those three uh, components. Uh, and then um, everything else we want to abstract away from the BU, we put it in what we call platform, um, which is all the bullshit, the other bullshit that goes into building a company like HR and real estate, <laughs> you know, and, and legal and blah, blah, blah. So we want to extract all that away so the BUs just focus on delivering value to customers and that's it uh, uh, and building their businesses. And then how we manage them is we, we give these this trio, we treat them as a partnership. I actually don't meet with any of them outside of all three of them because I, I hold them jointly accountable. Um, we give them a PL and say, here's the amount of equity capital we're gonna invest in your business per year or per quarter, or whatever it is. Uh, and then anything you wanna spend beyond that, you have to earn your keep. And so they've got to go make the money to go, if they want to hire more, if we give them, you know, $2 million a quarter in, in equity burn, and they want to hire $3 million a year of people, a quarter of people, they have to go earn the extra million bucks to get it. Uh, and that's how they, that's how we manage them. And so I'm really just, man, I, I get to be a capital allocator. The, the most important decision I make is how much money do I give them? And they, they have to figure it out um, uh, from there. And so that's how we, we, we manage those teams. Totally makes sense how you align incentives of the team too with that that structure. It's fascinating to see the trifectas are still in play. Um, that was a very early construct. I think you had like right in the, in the founding days uh, it, it, to the point that you had. Um, I mean, it was sort of you and a CTO and a CPO were sort of the, the, the overall trifecta from day one, right? Yeah, that's right. We were the federal trifecta, and then uh, scaled down. We're, uh, we're right up on the hour. Um, there was one final question, which I've seen posted a couple of times, which was Lawrence saying, how do I become a qualified investor? Um, I, I expect you're going to share all about that soon. So feel free to speak to it. Um, <laughs> otherwise, if, you, if yeah. you'd like to. <laughs> uh, quick answer is I, I hope soon, uh, you know, but it might be a year or two where we've got some policy work to do. Right now, the only buyers are, we have about 150 institutional funds that are qualified institutional buyers. Most of them are crossover funds. Uh, that, that are public market investors that are trying to take early positions in private companies. But, but my hope is give, give, us, give us a decade uh, and then everybody will go to invest in Cardinals. Love it. 
And uh, and that's the hour, Henry. Really, really appreciate you coming in. That was fun. Um, got a few questions off my back that I've been, I've been meaning to ask you as well. So um, we'll uh, look forward to having many, many on deck founder companies listening on Carter X and then the maybe near through through distant future as well. Um, thanks, everyone. You know where to find Henry with questions and and Reed and the Carter team who dialed in. Uh, and really appreciate having you aboard as a partner as well. I think um, the. Carter launch program has been super helpful for, for people just getting started at the, the very early stages. Thanks, everyone.